Hi everyone, uh, my name is Jamie Hayes and um, yeah, I'm a PhD student from University College London. So today I'm just going to talk a little bit about website fingerprinting attacks and um, as I said, uh, I was, this is joint work with my supervisor, George Denisis. So um, as you heard from Philip, uh, Tor is a, a way to basically uh, delink the sender-receiver relationship when you, you know, go to a website. So what happens when you fire up the Tor browser is um, you put into the URL bar the address, the, you know, the website that you want to visit. And before the network traffic actually reaches this website, it traverses three different volunteer relays. OK, so the adversary in the website fingerprinting tries to learn this relationship between uh, sender and receiver. It tries to specifically learn what website you're visiting. And so how this works is the adversary will first um, act like a normal client on Tor. So it will pick a bunch of websites that it actually cares about fingerprinting and knowing if someone has visited. So in this example, we have uh, Facebook, Google, and Reddit. And it just issues requests to these sites. The idea is that each site will have some kind of unique network traffic um, fingerprint. And so they can create fingerprints that are unique <coughs> to these websites. So this is what they do. So in this example, the adversary creates unique fingerprints for Facebook, Google, and Reddit. And then when a client comes along, the adversary will sit on some link between the uh, client and the, the adversary will sit on some link between the client and the entry, uh, entry guard and just passively collect the client's traffic. And so when clients browse to more and more websites, it'll create different fingerprints for these websites, and then with some degree of confidence output whether it thinks the client has visited one of these sites that it wants to monitor. So that's roughly how website fingerprinting works. In the past, um, people, researchers evaluated this kind of um, attacks in a closed world setting. So in this setting, um, an attacker would choose some number of websites, so uh, end websites, and then we would only allow the client to visit these same end websites. And this was quite rightly criticized for being completely unrealistic. Right? In a, you know, if this attack was going on in practice, because it's a passive attack, you know, the client is not limited or constrained to visit these same websites. This vis it, can, it can visit the entire internet, basically. So to kind of reflect that, people started, started uh, evaluating these attacks in an open world. So in the open world, the attacker again chooses these end websites, but now we allow the client to visit maybe some other websites that the attacker didn't train on or you know, care about fingerprinting, so some unmonitored websites. Okay, so the contributions that we, um, that, for, that this work poses, uh, we have a new attack based on random forest and K nearest neighbor, so two very common techniques within machine learning. The KNN attack was first actually used in this venue a couple of years ago by Tao Wang and his co-authors. So we kind of build on that attack a little bit. We present a preliminary analysis of which features are most important, as in which um, types, attributes within a network traffic leak the most information about which website you're actually accessing. Now, this is because, this is very important, because if you know, um, it's, we need to know what um, content within network traffic leaks the most information so then we can build better defenses. It's not good enough to know, um, you know if an attack works or if a defense works. It's very important to know why the attack works and what things are leaking information within a website. We also test our, evaluate our attack on quite a large open world, so over 100,000 websites. Uh, in the past, researchers were evaluating on like five or 10 or 20,000 websites, so we kind of increased that a little bit. Um, there's some concurrent work by Panchenko and his group that have done similar things at this year's NDSS, so that's pretty cool. And we also experiment with both standard websites as well as Tor hidden services. Okay. So, what kind of features did we use? Well, we, we used a very diverse feature set um, consisting of you know, some new features that we've come up with and kind of drawing on the past, um, past pe people's past work to, to find the most important features. So we used things like volume information, so the total number of packets that were generated during a website load, um, as well as things like uh, timing information, so the times that packets were sent and received, things like that. This is a... We need a very diverse feature set, is what I'm trying to say, because certain website fingerprint defenses will target subsets of features. So some defenses may inject packets to 
destroyed the ability for a classifier to um, use volume information. Some defenses may rate limit packets, so delay packets to some, to some degree, to then not let the classifier exploit timing information. And so if you want a, an attack to kind of work against any of these defenses, you need a very diverse feature set so that if some subsets of features are blocked, the other subsets of features in your feature set kind of compensate for that. Um, so this is the feature importance graph that I'm not sure if you can see. But this, so we used 150 features, and we found about 20 or 30 of these were relatively quite important. And then there's a sharp drop off, and we have sort of a dimin diminishing returns of importance for the, for the, the rest, like 100 features or so. Uh, but the best features we found, and I think this is confirming what other researchers have found in the past too, is that the actual total number of uh, incoming and outgoing packets leaked by far the most information to an attack. And this stands to reason if you think about it. I mean, if you take Google, for example, which has a landing page which is very small, and then if you look at another page like the New York Times or The Guardian, which has a lot of content, it has a lot of um, you know, images and text. So even to the naked eye, it's very easy to, to see that these are two, have two different sizes. And this, is like, this simple feature is easily exploited by you know, advanced classification techniques. Uh, and we also find as well that information that's leaked from the you know, first second or so of a website load, so the kind of get request and then the downloaded and downloading of the index HTML, leaks a lot more information, say, the end of the website load, which may be a bit variable. Okay, so how does this attack work? So given some, um, given a website, we load it and we record the network traffic that was generated by that load. So we record the times that packets were sent and received. And then we just convert it into this uh, feature set. So you know, like total number of packets that were generated, things like that. And then we pass it into a random forest. So a random forest is an ensemble of decision trees. And I'm sure you all know what a decision tree is. Very simple construct that takes some kind of input and um, you know, tries to work out how best to split the data up until it lands upon a leaf, which is the category for that data. Um, so the, the random forest takes a bunch of these decision trees and usually uses some kind of voting mechanism to decide on how this input should be classified. Um, and so instead of doing classification just using random forest, we instead take the, um, we use the random forest to create the fingerprint. So what we do is we um, look at the positions of the leaf nodes, um, the input that the leaf nodes uh, were, fell upon, and we take those positions as the fingerprint for this input. And then what we do is we use the k nearest neighbor classification technique to finally classify an input. So for example, if we have a new website and we want to classify it, uh, well, we've already got ground truth from the training data. So if we wanted to classify a new input, we look at, say, the five nearest neighbors to this new input. And if all these five nearest neighbors agree on classification on what website this new input should be classified as, then we just classify it as that website. If uh, any of these five nearest neighbors disagree on classification, so if maybe some of them said it was website A and some said website B, then we just mark this new uh, input as a website that the, um, that the adversary didn't care about, so an unmonitored website. Okay, so before I discuss how well the attack worked, I'd like to speak a little bit about the base rate, and which comes up a lot in website fingerprinting research. So when people first started um, looking into website fingerprinting, researchers were getting very high true positive rates and very low false positive rates, which looked um, you know, really good. But they were usually only evaluating on a few hundred or maybe a yeah, thousand or two uh, websites, which means that you know, the actual number of false alarms is quite low. Of course, in practice, people, there is no real upper bound, like hard upper bound, to the number of websites that someone's going to visit. This is going to increase and increase over time. So the point is that the false positive rate needs to be extremely low in practice for an attack to take place, right, to actually withstand the number of false alarms. For example, if you had a false positive rate of just 1% and a client loads 100 unmonitored pages, the attacker is going to, on average, think one of these is an incorrectly um, unmonitored page. And over time, if the client visits like a million pages, we're going to, the attacker is going to get about 10,000 false alarms, which is just far too high. So for an attack to, play, to withstand the number of false alarms, the false positive rate needs to be you know, orders of magnitude lower than 1%. Okay, so here are the accuracy metrics that we use to 
evaluate the attack. The first was the standard true positive rate, which is the probability that a monitored page is classified correctly as that monitored page. The false positive rate, which is the probability that a unmonitored page is incorrectly classified as a monitored page. And excuse me, something called the Bayesian detection rate, which is the probability that a page corresponds to the correct monitored page given that it was classified, uh, it recognized as that monitored page. So the Bayesian detection rate takes into account things like the true positive rate, the false positive rate, the size of your monitored web, uh, the number of your monitored websites, and the number of unmonitored websites that you're you know, testing with. So it takes into account um, the base rate and gives you a real idea of actually how well your attack is performing. It tells you what is the actual probability that your classifier made a correct prediction. Okay. So I said that we um, fingerprinted Tor Hidden Services as well as standard web pages. So I'll just briefly tell you what Tor Hidden Services are for maybe a few of you that don't know. So when you use um, you know, standard Tor you, and you browse to Wikipedia through your Tor browser, you're usually only getting sender anonymity, right? You, uh, Wikipedia doesn't try to hide where they're located. It doesn't have, it has a public IP address. Um, but there are some entities that have a very good reason not to want to um, have this as public information. For example, SecureDrop, which is a whistleblowing platform for journalists, um, hosts a lot of extre extremely sensitive content. Um, and they have a very good reason to not want to you know, publicly have publicly known where their servers are located and things like that. So they require receiver anonymity as well as um, clients re requiring sender anonymity. And so how the Torn service setup works when, um, well, the adversary in the uh, threat model sits in the same place, so it sits uh, on like the, in, the um, at the edge of the network, but now the website that your, the client wants to browse to is actually part of the Tor network, so it's hosted within the Tor network. And what, when the client wants to browse a website first, the website actually creates something called an introduction point to just some node within the Tor network. It uploads this information to something called a Tor Hidden Service Directory. The client then downloads this information, so it discovers where these introduction points are and creates two circuits, one called a rendezvous point and another, called an, uh, another to the introduction point, and then tells the, the website where this rendezvous point is located. The, the website removes, these, removes this uh, circuit and creates a new circuit to this rendezvous point, and then the client can start actually browsing this uh, website. Okay, so before I get into the, how well the attack worked, all the... Um, Traffic was collected via Tor, um, clearly, and we used two monitor data sets, one consisting of Alexa sites, so Google, Wikipedia, things like that, and another of popular Tor Hidden Services, as listed by um, Army, which is a search engine for Tor Hidden Services. Uh, we only collected the landing page for each web, uh, website, so maybe a more apt name would be web page fingerprinting, but, but uh, as is standard in website fingerprinting. And, we only, and then we use a, an additional 100,000 extra websites for this kind of unmonitored uh, data set where the adversary doesn't care about fingerprinting it. Um, yeah. Okay, so we found um, that parameter tuning was a huge deal in uh, the accuracy of the attack. And I think this is just echoing what Tao Wang found with when he used his k nearest neighbor classifier. So the left-hand figure shows uh, the true positive and false positive rate um, for different numbers of uh, nearest neighbors used for final classification. So the top right of the left-hand figure shows the uh, true positive rate and false positive rate when we just use one neighbor. And because we just use one neighbor, there's much uh, greater opportunity for false positives to arise. So the false positive rate is you know, comparatively quite high. And at the bottom left is when we use five or six uh, neighbors for final classification. And so it's quite unlikely that five or six of these neighbors um, all incorrectly have the same label. So the false positive, false positive rate is relatively low. Uh, the point is that we can kind of tune this attack um, based on if we care more about true positives or false positives. So it gives, some, gives us some latitude to you know, kind of configure the attack. And the right hand... Uh, figure just shows the, uh, that the attack doesn't really benefit from adding more trees. After we hit a certain, uh, certain number of trees, after like 10 or 15 trees, the attack doesn't like, you know, incre dramatically increase in accuracy. So we could use 100 or 20 trees and 
pretty much get the same, same accuracy. OK. So here are the results for the um, Alexa monitored set as we increase the number of unmonitored sites. <coughs> so we have a steady true positive rate of about 96% when using just one neighbor. Uh, but we ha also have a, quite a steady false positive rate of just under 4%. And you know, when we're testing against 100,000 unmonitored sites, that means we're getting quite, actually quite a few thousand um, false positives, so not that great. Um, for the Tor Hidden Service data set, uh, the true positive rate dropped by about 10% to 85, 86% uh, for, regardless of the number of unmonitored sites. But the false positive rate, false positive rate dropped dramatic, dramatically to about 0.3, 0.2%. Meaning that if we were testing against you know, 20 or 30,000 um, web pages, we only have false positives in the order of tens and not hundreds or thousands, which you know, the, the attacker might be able to cope with. Okay, and here is the two, two uh, monitored sets, uh, the beta detection rate for the two monitored sets. So in the bottom figure is for the Alexa monitored set. And uh, things look pretty good in terms of how well our classifiers making a classification when we're testing against 10 or 20 or 30,000 unmonitored sites. Like we're getting you know, around 80% accuracy. Um, as we increase to about 100,000 100, unmonitored sites, we um, suffer quite badly. The classifier is making more incorrect predictions than correct predictions, which isn't great. Things, again, look quite different in the Tor Hidden Service data set, though. Um, we have um, up to about 50 or 60,000, we have a, an accuracy of over 90%, meaning that the classifier is actually making correct prediction given some input 90% of the time. Um, and even when we hit 100,000, we're only getting uh, incorrect predictions 20% of the time. Okay. Um, okay, just before I finish, I'd like to speak a little bit about the limitations of this work and actually pretty much most website fingerprinting research. So the first problem is we have this bunch of websites, this unmonitored data set and this monitored data set, which has websites in it. And we just assume that someone would browse to any of these uniformly at random, right? So with some uniform probability. That doesn't really make sense. I mean, people have different tastes. You know, people, some people may visit social media sites all the time. Some people may visit news sites all the time. Um, and so if we could, before we launch the attack, directly have, you know, have an informed prior that, sh um, that shows like which type of site people may visit, then I expect we could kind of remove some of these sites from, the, from, the, uh, from, the, from this data set and have a much better, much better results. Get, uh, estimating this prior without some kind of side knowledge of who you're attacking, I think is, it doesn't, it's not clear to me how to do that. So that's one limitation. Uh, the other problem is that the website for encrypting research basically cheats. Uh, given some stream of data, some network, data, network traffic data, we assume that the attacker can pretty much like, you know, perfectly know when a, the start and stop of a website load is. And also that the client doesn't do things like multiple tab browsing. It doesn't, uh, they don't listen to music or download things in the background, which may add noise to the signal. But of course, you know, people do do these things. People do multiple tab browsing on tour. They download things maybe in the background. Um, and so until we know how well these, uh, how well these attacks cope with this, this more realistic scenario, I don't think it's um, right to say that maybe Tor users are actually vulnerable to these attacks. Uh, so Tao Wang did some pretty cool research at PETS actually this year that started to look into this, but there's much more um, research that should be done here. Okay, but in conclusion, uh, I think the open world, it, there was kind of an assumption that the open world presented a really big problem in that the actual total number of false alarms overwhelmed the, uh, overwhelmed the attacker as you increase the number of unmonitored sites. And when we were testing against four, you know, 40 or 30,000 um, unmonitored sites, that wasn't the case. We were getting accuracies in you know, the 90 percentile. And even when we increase it to like uh, 100,000, even in the, on, in the hidden service data set, we were still getting you know, very, very accurate results, high accurate results. So 
And you know, this att these attacks are only going to you know, increase in accuracy. Like people are going to use better techniques than what I've done. I mean, I just use two very standard um, machine learning techniques. People can, are going to start using better, like you know, deep learning techniques. I, I assume and probably get much more, much better results. So I don't think these kind of problems are intractable. The other, th the other thing that we found was that there is definitely a distinguishability between Tor hidden services and normal websites. Meaning that if I give you, if you give me some network traffic, I can tell with some high degree of confidence whether you're actually browsing a Tor hidden service or not. Because Tor hidden services, by their very nature, host very sensitive content, that is, believes people that you know access this, this sensitive content to, to vulnerable to this kind of attack. Um, and so I think it's worth trying to research and why there is this distinguishability, so we can then mitigate it. Um, all the code is available on my website and the data, and you know, feel free to ask me any questions now or later. Thank you. Uh, Aaron Johnson, Neil Research Lab. Uh, at the very beginning, you listed 100-something features, and you were... 150, um, yes. Okay, then you were listing how uh, effective they were. Uh, how did you obtain those features? Where did you get them? What were they? So, I mean, the full list is available in the paper. Uh, there were things like, you know, st the, there were things like, you know, timing features, like the time, the time that the page took to load. There were volume features, like the time that the total number of um, packets that were sent and received during a communication uh, during a website load. Um, there were standard features that people have used time and time again in um, website fingerprinting research. Um, but the full list is available in my paper. I see. So you manually constructed that. Yes, it's not. It's not an automatic. There's no like kind of automatic feature generation. It's uh, you know it's ma it's handmade. Yes. Okay. Thanks. David Fifield from UC Berkeley. Uh, the Tor hidden service protocol, the beginning with the introduction point and the rendezvous point, is going to happen for every access to a Tor hidden service. Um, is that process? noisy in terms of the features it generates, or is it consistent? And also, did you feed that, was that part of the input to your featureization, or did you start it when the website starts to load? We started um, in both scenarios. So when we first started um, researching this, we chose to actually fingerprint the entire process, so from the introduction point to the rendezvous point. I think Alvig Kwan, from maybe from actually this venue last year, um, found that these kind of um, fingerprinting these circuits um, leaked a lot of information, so it was. It's possible to, I mean, because it's circuit creation, no matter what, even if you're visiting, you know, a normal website, and it's, and he found that it's easy to distinguish if you're having a circuit creation to then access a hidden service rather than a normal website. Um, the other reason that I think maybe there's some kind of distinguishability between toy and services and standard websites is that we found that um, the landing pages of hidden services were much much smaller than. Um, normal websites. So, I mean, the toy and service landing pages were usually to some kind of forum, and they, you know, they were in the order of like less than a megabyte. Um, and maybe that kind of distinguished them from normal um, normal pages. But that's, you know, that's a guess. I'm not sure why. Hey, uh, I have one question for you as well. Um, so, given that the state of website fingerprinting attacks seems to be getting better every year or with every conference. Uh, how should anonymity systems such as the Tor project uh, respond uh, to these threats? And I'm also curious, as an aside, if you've discussed these attacks with someone from the Tor project and what their thoughts have been. So, um, I think the Tor and service, Tor, Tor, the Tor project introduced things like a few years ago, like randomized pipelining that um, you know randomizes the order that requests are made. Um, I think that quite rightly they're unwilling to introduce um, heavy, heavy de defenses, right? You, I mean, you could just pad every website with you know, hundreds and hundreds of extra packets and just confuse classifiers. It's quite easy to do. And um, to do that without you know, having a huge, like, huge expense of bandwidth, which I, quite rightly Tor, the Tor project is probably concerned with, um, is difficult. So there's been some research quite recently that's, done, that's, done, um, that's looked into probabilistic techniques to you know, inserting packets with some instead of packets into some kind of stream with some kind of you know, um, probabilistic um, schemes. Uh, but until 
we find a defense that you know has not too high a bandwidth overhead, I don't think the Tor project is willing to um, introduce it, especially especially when we haven't really proven that these attacks are, you know, the, the Tor users are practically vulnerable to these attacks. So you mentioned. Um some limitations of this work about the way that you were doing the crawling. I was wondering which of these things do you think would have the most impact if you actually like, in, in terms of methodology, which thing would you do first to try to be more realistic? To, sorry, to be more realistic? More, more realistic, yeah. I think the, um, the big one, the big thing that it, when it comes to me is estimating within a, a stream of uh, network traffic where the actual start and stop time of websites are and the ability to um, Recognize a website, perhaps if you can't actually capture the entire um, the entire load when it's not be, when it's not noisy, right? When it, when people aren't doing multiple tabs and things like that. I think um, that's probably the next step in terms of website fingerprinting research. All right. Let's thank Jamie again.